Hi, uh, my name is Gisan Ha. I am preparing uh, actually a video of myself uh, since AAO requested. But I thought rather than talking about myself, might be more interesting if I talk about my research. So I decided to present a uh, short uh, story of what I'm doing. Um, and actually, I'm a statistician. And I joined the orthodontics division in School of Dentistry in 2004. And then I have been working with uh, orthodontists and dentists for many years. And they, their data actually motivate me uh, getting into uh, complex and high dimensional data analysis. So I'll just uh, briefly tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, I will just talk about what kind of data is available these days and my passion for uh, what I'm doing is coming from actually pediatric obstructive sleep amnia, uh, OSA. And I'm trying to, to come up with a new way of analyzing complex and high dimensional data, uh, combining three method. Due to in high computational power these days, statisticians and computing scientists and data scientists, they are capable of looking into a very complex data set. So there are many complex data sets, but I just show you here several examples. Uh, DNA, RNA sequences, and image data. It could be images for natural images, or could be uh, medical images. And then also um, networks of brain and social networks. So I just pictorially, I, I'm here presenting those. Um, so the complex data is available. We are capable of analyzing data because of high computational power. But however, this brings us challenging because, because of the complexity in data, the, these, those conventional classical methods in statistics and computing science may not work any longer. Therefore, it is necessary developing new method in data analysis. So my proposal is uh, statistical and topological learning, which combines actually three uh, major scientific disciplines, such as statistics, computational topology, and computing science. As I told you, this high dimensional complex data analysis in FEG was motivated by OSA study. So let me explain to you briefly what is OSA study is, particularly in children. So there are many ways of uh, explaining uh, obstructive sleep amnia, OSA, but one of the form of sleep disorder, the breathing, they are uh, characterized by partial or complete airway obstructions while people are sleeping. It turns out prevalence of OSA in school children is 1 to 4 percent, which is quite high. Uh, if this OSA is not treated on time, the consequence could be very detrimental. For example, they may have uh, behavior issues, reflux, obesity, hypertension, cardiovascular, and neurocognitive dis dysfunction, name just few. So immediately, I try to learn what is the best way to diagnose OSA. And then I learned it, that overnight polysomnography is gold standard. So what is PS, this overnight uh, polysomnography or uh, PSG, in fact, measures many, many variables. For example, sleep efficiency, duration, sleep stages, oxygen saturation, carbon dioxide, and those uh, brain function like EEG, muscle activities, and heart rhythms, and, and so on and so forth. However, PSG, it turns out, is very expensive, very laborious, because children have to stay overnight in a, in a lab, right? And uh, of course, it's, uh, parents and children have to travel. It's very inconvenient. 
and expensive. Um, in Alberta, it's not covered by Alberta Healthcare, so people have to pay for it. And it's not that accessible because there are not many sleep clinics. Okay. Um, also, the waiting period is about 6 to 24 months. So you may say, hey, that's not very long, but among the growing children, it could be very uh, dangerous in a sense that they may delay in diagnosis. So if you miss the treatment time, it may cause a lot of problem when they grow up later. So that's what I have found out as I digging into more about OSA uh, studies. So I uh, many researchers saying that maybe maybe we should look for a different way of diagnosis method rather than PSG. So a few people look at it in this uh, aspect of research. And then I still remember a few years ago, I don't know who told me, somebody told me that experienced orthodontist and dentist, they are capable of screening OSA in particularly children, or of course adult as well, by just observing their facial form, craniofacial form. So when I heard this, heard this one for the first time, I was so thrilled and I said, I'm, I got to do research on this topic. I mean, this is so interesting not to do it. Um, but of course, you know, this is the exciting part in step zero, but if you go further, it gets more complicated, right? So I was thinking why orthodontists or experienced dentists can do such a remarkable things. And it is because they see patients more regularly uh, and more often compared to maybe uh, medical doctors. And then also they, uh, they have 3D imaging resources and they look at the photos and 3D photos and 2D photos a lot. So because of their, their, this experience and training, they seem to be uh, very good at you know, uh, examining, observing the faces. So a team of clinicians at University of Alberta, they come up with craniofacial dental index. Um, they prepared, this index measures from pro profile uh, mid deficiency and uh, to uh, overbite and uh, posterior bites. They prepare this index not only for themselves, like orthodontists and dentists, but also for, um, let's say, health practitioners such as nurses, uh, regular dentists, or s and uh, family doctors. This index is really doesn't take very long. Uh, if they go through this in maybe two, three minutes, if the reason for index this hopefully for use for them would be s uh, so that they, this practi health practitioners can refer those patients to a specialist. Um, so as I get into digging into more what's going on in OSA research, I mean, you can imagine there are, you know, hundreds, hundreds of papers have been published. And then I was more interested in what other potential um, diagnostic uh, tools or diagnostic uh, variables and values might be considered other than PSG. Of course, PSG is a gold standard is the best, and that's what it is considered as a most um, effective way of doing it. But what about other variables, something like democrat demographic information, medical history, also family history of OSA, or environment. Some say that if you have a you know, birds or cats, it could be, uh, maybe it causes problem, we don't know that yet. Uh, what about their, how, what about their quality of life, mental health, and also sleep questionnaires, and so on, right? So there are many, many factors, variables, possibly useful for explaining the relationship between them and OSA. There are more here. Uh, for example, what about airway inflammation? Right? How do you even measure it? What about GERD? 
also this new uh, recent paper by uh, Gozal and his uh, colleagues. They were, uh, I this is a scoping review paper. They look at hundreds, many, many papers, particularly looking at biomedical markers, like blood markers and uh, saliva markers or urinary markers. It could be possibly potential um, OSA diagnosis. Also, uh, this part number 80 will be very done very regularly by dentists and uh, orthodontists. They look at the facial balance, tooth eruptions, and cranial facial index analysis, oral clinical evaluations, and so on. And then as I mentioned, the 3D photo, which I'm very interested about, they, we can study on form and shape of cranial facial uh, of children. What about upper airway and the nasal airway? Would the shape deform before and after the treatment, for example, uh, surgery, you know, ANT? Uh, it is very well known that the shape and the volume or size of upper airway is not much associated with OSA. People think that the dynamic flow through the upper airway is probably tells us a more story. So it's very exciting, but it turns out segmenting upper and nasal airway is not an easy task. Very difficult to, to, to do that if you want to do it very accurately. So uh, team of U U uh, University of Alberta, they, they uh, did it in, in this um, this paper tw number 23. And the, um, also, the, the segmentation itself is hard, but more difficult one is modeling dynamic airflow in upper airway. I mean, flu fluid dynamic airways itself is very difficult, but upper airway is much more difficult because it, is, it has a soft tissue. It's easy to do it if it's a hard tissue, like air, air, airplane and so on, but it, this is a soft tissue, so it's a very difficult problem. But this airflow really caught my eyes because it's very challenging, but also it's, it's just like amazing how if we can model the airflow, you know, when, when the patients are sleeping, they would be very interesting, but very challenging problems. So as earlier I said, I'm interested in complex and high dimensional data analysis, so you may ask, is OSA data is complex and high dimensional? And I'm saying yes. In fact, this is what motivates my research. Why is it? Why do I call it OSA is complex? It because it it consists of several types of data, like uh, medical data or questionnaire is just typical data. You can apply classical statistical method. Everyone knows how to do that. But also it contains time series like EEG, EMG, produced by uh, polysomnography. And also the shape analysis based on craniofacial and upper airway. Those types of data is very different. If you want to analyze those data, you have to uh, apply very different method for each. Like time series has a very typical way of analyzing it. Of course, shape analysis has a typical different way of analyzing quite different from time series analysis or even you know usual classical statistics. That's why it's complex because I would like to analyze all these different types of data simultaneously. So how do you do that, right? That's why I call it this data is complex. Why do you say high dimensional? Recruiting patients is very difficult. I am aiming 100. This is really, uh, you know, I'm, I'm it's possible, but it takes a long time. So sample size, I'm talking about 100. But the variables I'm measuring could be way more than 600. So in the classical statistics, usually number of variables you are studying or analyzing is much smaller than sample size. But here is opposite. Sample size is way, way smaller than the variables you are going to analyze. So that's why we call high dimensional data analysis. So conventional statistical method or machine learning method in computation, uh, computing science uh, is not going to fly. 
So currently I'm asking specific research questions. I just wanted to share with you just a few of them. So in current research I'm conducting now, there will be 12 clinicians, one sleep specialist and 11 clinicians. Uh, and they will look at all those uh, recruited patients' information and they will classify those patients in one of four categories. Minimal, mild, moderate, or severe. Or they, so they are checking their um, severity of OSA. So my first question is, you know, these clinicians who are not sleep specialists, are they capable of screen children accurately, right, based on uh, 3D photos, as they claimed, right? Also, uh, what about among, so the first part, will this will analyze, I will analyze the sleep specialist classification. I'm going to compare classifications done by 11 uh, non-sleep specialists, see how accurate their the classifi classification is. Also, the second part is that among non-specialists, 11 uh, specialists, uh, among uh, non-sleep specialists, are they consistent within themselves? I was told that also dentists, dentists, they, they are not consistent. If you ask them classification today and then one month later, uh, they may change their mind. So I would like to see whether they are consistent within themselves. And then number three is more my statistical uh, passion is that can I de develop new statistical model can predict severity of OSA, considering 600 more or so variables. Yeah. Also more um, challenging problem will be moving forward to uh, upper airway. Would the shape of upper airway different among OSA children or normal children, normal children. What about even more challenging? I don't know how long it's going to take for me to tackle on it, but what about dynamic flow and turbulence in upper airway? You know, so many questions here so far. I don't have any, any answers, but that's exactly where I am heading. And uh, here are references. And of course, this research is not, part, I cannot do it alone. I have several students have been working with me. Uh, Matthew Pietrosanu, Matthew Chalifor, Izu, and those three clinics, uh, pediatric clinic, uh, ortho clinic, and uh, sleep lab in University of Alberta. Uh, they are helping me a lot in terms of equipment and uh, observation and, and getting all the data from patients. Also, uh, to carry out research, we need the funding, obviously. So I have, uh, I thank those NSERC and McIntyre Memorial Fund from Orthodontics Division. And then I also got a few years ago a small grant from Wickery, it's a seed grant, and moreover, uh, AAO uh, grant, uh, biomedical research. Thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm.